Good morning, Interweb, Spec Biolog 5. We are, as always, continuing to world build our fictional planet, Torvelt, cramming it full of cute little critters. In this video, we're going to take our ancestral body plan and derive from it, hopefully, lots of interesting life forms. Oh, now, before we start, just a, a quick little nomenclature thing. Recall this chap here, or rather the group of organisms this chap represents. Uh, they are called the Blasenkronen. Blasenkrone, singular. Blasenkronen, plural. Bubble crowns. Shout out patron Rune uh, for that suggestion. And this group represents the sort of most basal organisms in the phyla that I'm going to call segments. No prizes for guessing why. All organisms in this phyla are segmented. So let's build upon this segments tree. So our Blasenkronen, they are mixotrophs. I know that I want to split the trophic modes up into dedicated autotrophs and dedicated heterotrophs, leaving behind some vestigial mixotrophs so we can get our pseudoplants and our animals. Now, full disclosure, I know exactly what I want to do for the heterotrophs because I've kind of worked it out ahead of time. I have no idea or have I have very little idea about what we're going to do with the autotrophs. So let me kind of outline the heterotrophic line, fill out that cladogram, and then hopefully use that to be able to work out what is happening with these autotrophs. And that should be the video. So here's the heterotrophic plan. Take our Blasenkronen, turn them into fish, and have those fish come onto land, kind of just like what happened on Earth, except uh, we won't get quadrupeds out of these fish. We'll do something more interesting, I think. Bubble tree to fish to land. That's the game plan. And I think we can get there through a series of changes. So we take our bubble tree and we turn it into effectively a polyp. We take that polyp and we turn it into effectively a jellyfish. Then we turn that jellyfish into effectively a starfish. And we take that starfish and we turn that into a fish fish. How delightful. So given this plan, two things stick out to me. Number one, our body plan has many segments, five to be precise. But when I look at a polyp, it doesn't have to be this way, but I think two segments. I think like a body segment and I think like a feeding segment. So immediately I'm thinking, I'll make just a little list of things to do here. I'm thinking uh, tagmosis, which is the kind of reduction of segments, collapsing together of segments and like specialization of those segments. So essentially going from five to two segments. And the second thing that pops out to me here is polyps. Whenever I think polyp, I, my mind goes to coral reefs. And immediately I'm like, hold on a second, what happens if we had mixotrophic coral reefs? So like on Earth, corals are limited to within the tropics because they are symbiotic, um, what are they called, zooxanthellae? Is that correct? That's probably not right, hold on. Yes, it is zooxanthellae, excellent. I'm learning, slowly but surely. So they're like photosynthetic, symbiotic zooxanthellae sort of thing, uh, are very uh, temperature dependent. So if it's too cold, coral doesn't work, coral dies. If it's too warm, coral dies, etc. But if we have mixotrophic corals, we could easily have a scenario where you get coral reefs anywhere on the planet, not limited to the tropics, which, which, which is nice given that where our humans are is kind of like more in the temperate zone than in the tropics. So that's pretty cool. So mixotrophic almost certainly spelled wrong, coral, coraloids. Let's call them coraloids. So if we want those to be mixotrophic and we want this line to be heterotrophic, we'd have to make the switch to heterotrophy either here, like one branch of corals go full heterotroph and then spawn all of this nonsense, or we do it here. So that fact, that realization, uh, kind of can help us start a cladogram. Something like that. Blasenkronen, mixotrophic, outgroup stays the same, tagmosis occurs. I decided to put the tagmosis, the fusion of the segments, uh, pretty early on prior to the switch to autotrophy and heterotrophy, just so that's ancestral. I think that would make these forms easier to work with. Tagmosis occurs, yeah, then we got to switch to autotrophs, still have our tagmosified uh, mixotrophs knocking around. They become kind of coraloids, and then we get mixotrophic coraloids forming our kind of like uh, globe spanning cosmopolitan uh, coral reefs. And then some of those coral like things uh, become heterotrophic. Cool. I like that so far. Now back to our game plan. So we want to get a jellyfish. So a free swimming pelagic life form from a sessile polyp thing. And there is one way of doing that that I know. I'm sure there's many other ways, but the easiest way of doing that is to do 
some sort of neoteny. Uh, this is where a juvenile form retains its juvenile traits into adulthood. So we could just have the jellyfish descend from the larvae of our polyps. Something like that. So we have our heterotrophic polyps. Their larvae undergo neoteny and form kind of like plankton uh, swimming in in the sort of pelagic zone. Of these neotonic plankton, some remain small, stay as kind of plankton. Others grow nice and big and become what would look to us like jellyfish. That I think is decent. And then we can simply have one of our jellyfish just decide, uh, do you know what, pelagic living, not for me. I'm gonna settle on the seafloor. I'm gonna go benthic and just crawl about the place. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty simple. Let's sketch that in. Okay, very nice. Now, getting from a benthic starfish to a fish uh, might be a bit more of a trick. So let's just uh, do a little bit of sketchy, sketchy here for a second. So imagine this is our starfish here. We're looking top down on it. And for now, let's assume it has the same uh, radial symmetry as our blasenkrona, seven sided, so seven legs. So we, we could take this and we could bilateralize it along like this middle axis here. And, and because we have like an odd number of, uh, not segments, uh, legs here, when we bilateralize, we'll have to pair things up. So one uh, leg will remain necessarily unpaired. So we can turn that unpaired leg into a bit of a tail. So I'm thinking something like this. And I've labeled each of the legs here so you can see how they're pairing up. And this would be the, the anterior end and this the posterior end, just to be just to be clear. So functionally, if, if we assume the same uh, number of radial bits, uh, we'll get a hexapod, a benthic hexapod crawler thing. And then from there, I think that's that's really simple to be all like it gets sick of uh, living on the seafloor and it starts to stay, it decides to get up and uh, swim. These limbs turn into fins. Bish bash bosh, you got yourself a fish. Great. OK, yeah, so starfish. Some remain radial, some go bilateral. Of the bilaterals, some remain on the sea floor, others go up into the water, or they're all in the water, you know what I mean. Some of these become like fish, and some of those stay in the water, others go out in the land. Boom. Oh, and here's another fun thing we can do, speaking of land. If I take all of these boyos and shiftify them over a little bit, maybe we can have some of our starfish come out onto land. So we'd have radial uh, life forms on land. And before everyone gets really excited, it's like, oh yes, great, radial elephants. I'm so happy. Uh, I'm thinking possibly these radial land starfish things, like they could fill a role uh, similar to like snails, mollusks on land. They're there, but I'd hardly call them, you know, front and center. So that's what I'm, I'm thinking there. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. Okay, so that is the, the heterotrophic line. Uh, now we need to do something with the autotrophic line. Right, so there's our blazon crona. We know tagmosis occurs early, so we have one base section plus one feeding section, which I'm going to work on the assumption would just look something like a, a little bubbly bush. That's when tagmosis occurs. And from th from there, we could literally just be all like, you come onto land like that. And when on land, we're going to have to develop uh, the concept of leaves like these bubbles are, are fine uh, underwater like they can double as air bladders which is really nice oh air bladders kelp hold on that's an idea I'll come back to that so they can double as air bladders but once we get onto land like square cube law and all that nonsense uh they're gonna have to like flatten into more leaf-like shapes but okay hold on oh oh not many thoughts okay let me let me, let me do this one first okay uh so our tagmosis thing here we could before we go on to land we could make a split, right? We could say one of these tagmosified blazon corner thing or segments, um, one of them goes really big and becomes essentially kelp. So it forms like kelp forests. And the other line stays pretty small and forms the equivalent of kind of like seagrass. And I guess it's probably from the seagrass where we get the members that come out onto land, I think. Maybe. And then, yeah, the other thing I was thinking, uh, recall these bubbles are inflatable. They're movable. Uh, so can we get like uh, retractable leaves? That is just <laughs> retractable. There we go. If we derive our leaves from these bubbles, can we maintain some of that movement into the modern form? Because like, I really don't want to just make like, here, here's a happy looking leaf. How delightful. There's a leaf. Great. Looks and works like an earth leaf done. Um, 
I'd like to do something more interesting. For, for now, this is fine. Let me just uh, sketch that into the cladogram. Okay, can't really think of much else to do in terms of differentiation there. So I guess the only thing I'd like to do, the, remain, the only remaining thing I'd like to do in this video is figure out this leaf thing. Like how are we deriving leaves from those wobbles? And then perhaps in the next video, we can start like honing in on the particular forms. Because right now this is all very much just like a quick sketch. And once we've kind of like roughed in our guidelines, we can go back and uh, really kind of uh, finesse the forms. Okay, first thing that occurs to me, we have our Blasen Cronin uh, bubble thing here. And when I think about taking a bubble and flattening it into a uh, leaf shape, you can either kind of compress it like this direction, if you will, or this direction. And I think I may have to get out Blender to demonstrate this fully, but either way you end up with a sort of a, either a satellite dish shaped leaf that's like perpendicular to the stem. There's a little gammy tips, by the way. Or you end up with a leaf leaf that's uh, parallel with the stem. I'll open up Blender just to make sure we can all visualize that. Right, so here we have our kind of like a, a rough mock-up of our blazing Corona bubble. So we have our stems or branches, if you will, and then the actual bubble. And so if we flatten this into a leaf-like shape, we can do uh, this, flatten it in this kind of direction, right? So you end up with like a satellite dish sort of shape, or you can flatten it in this direction. So you end up with the leaf sort of shape. This works just fine, obviously, because like earth leaves, um, but does this satellite dish thing work? I'm always kind to be like, yeah, let's just do it because it's weird and different and blah. But I, I don't know if this is a good idea. Cause like, imagine if I'm a little bush, right? And I come out onto land and it's like, I have all the, I have these little branches, etc., And I have these bubbles on the branches and the sunlight is coming down from on top of me. In in general, I appreciate, yes, you know, you know, different attitudes of sunset, but in, in general, the sunlight is coming from above the plant. And so having this like satellite dish orientation means that it's kind of, the leaf is orientated parallel-ish to the incoming sun rays, which is not, doesn't strike me as efficient as being orientated perpendicular, right? So possibly this is a bit silly. I mean, it would be cool. You'd end up with like shrubs that would look more like the kind of antenna towers, but I don't know. I don't know. And yes, I appreciate these could move, right? These could tilt these leaves to face more of the incoming sunlight, but it just seems like this is by far the most natural way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's earth leaf. I think we're in a situation with earth leaves. And that's fine because this whole retractable stuff, we can make the retractable stuff uh, work. We uh, can differentiate them a little bit. Um, immediately, my mind is taken to uh, deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the winter. Maybe on this planet, plants, uh, segment plants, don't lose their leaves in winter or the deciduous varieties of them don't lose their leaves in winter. Instead, they just shrivel up. So, oh, and also, hold on, bracing. So at some point, whether it's in the body plan or not, at some point, some sort of like bracing structures are going to have to emerge to keep this upright, which means that, and I think what structures uh, emerge are arbitrary. Uh, so it's kind of up to me, I think, to design how, basically how the the structure of the leaf works because it's ultimately it's going to be derived from the bubble bracing and it, it'll be I imagine it'd be kind of radial right so a leaf then uh, if we just assume a regular leaf shape for a second it need not actually be this shape and in fact many varieties would probably exist we assume that i can assume any number of structural things um so maybe what if we say so this has to come through here and there's a gammy tip up here. I kind of want to just have like three of them, like the Mercedes Benz logo, right? Like here's a stem and then the leaf is like an arrow shape. God, it's awful. That's <laughs> such a terrible drawing. It's like an arrow shape thing. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that aside for a second. This is a summer leaf. And then in winter, instead of throwing away all of that which you've grown, it'll just like shrivel up like this. Yeah. And because these would be inflated based on like photosynthetic activity, the same thing could occur here. Like once the photosynthetic activity uh, drops off, because like the sun isn't out as much, the mechanisms keeping this leaf inflated, if you will, drop off as well. And so it just naturally shrivels up. Hmm. And also you could get a like a conifer type jazz happening here, as in it remains shriveled 
in colder regions interesting because yeah you don't want to have this big old surface here to radiate away all the heat in cold regions yeah i kind of like that let's see if that can be penciled in in the cladogram okay cool uh, the final thing that occurred to me here if we look at our original blasm corner uh, you'll note that uh, the photosynthetic pigment is orange in color so the only photosynthetic surfaces are the orange bubbles the stalk is doing nothing so that means unless we want to end up with uh, an, uh, you know an exact number of leaves what is that that's uh, five segments times seven sided symmetry is 35 right we have 35 bubbles i if we don't do something about it we're going to end up with exactly 35 leaves or less which i mean i think is fine but we probably should invoke something like there's a doubling up right like the these branches gain the ability to to copy bubbles yeah yeah let's do the bubble copying here and also for no other reason than just vibes uh, i think it might be an idea to drop the the number of uh, the, the number of symmetry the symmetrical number uh down so it is seven-sided symmetry here just to differentiate it from what's going on over on this side, uh, we'll drop this down to, I think, five-sided symmetry, just to keep it odd. Uh, even though, much like with our um, our starfish bilateralization thing from earlier, I think the most logical thing to do would be to just drop the unpaired one and to go to six-sided symmetry, but I don't really want to do that. Um, so we'll just drop a pair, right, and go to five-sided symmetry. Yeah, just to change up their look a bit. Okay, and I guess one last thing before I go, uh, it worth bearing in mind that the different trophic modes uh, imply kind of depth. Like our autotrophs here, they have to be very close to the surface in the layers of the ocean where the sunlight penetrates. So all of these would be shallow organisms. Our mixotrophs, they could be like a sort of middle depth, I suppose, where there's still some um, sunlight going through the water column, uh, but they need to like bolster their diet with eating um, little critters. So these coral here could be like mid-level and upwards in the, in the water column. And then the heterotrophic ones, particularly these heterotrophic coral, I'm reminded of kind of a deep water coral. There's no sunlight going on, so it's full heterotrophy. So I'm, I'm just going to write this in heterotroph coral type thing this is going to be deep ocean these would be deep deep ocean organisms yeah okay i'm quite happy that i think that's a decent plan getting us to uh, at least the starting point of land like i said next time we'll start actually like drawing in forms to go with this kind of sketch So that's me. Thank you so much for watching. And also just a shout out for all the support for the German uh, naming convention. I really thought that would go down like a lead balloon, but there were just like, there was comment after comment after comment after comment after comment after comment, really just getting behind that decision. So thank you so much. I was, I was really pleasantly surprised. German for the win, eh? Thank you for watching. Thanks to the patrons for supporting the show. Thanks to Vanga Van Gogh, resident artist over here in Artifexian. And as always, the ever standing thank you to Bibliridine for teaching me everything I know about biology and helping out so much with this project. Right, until next time, it grows. <laughs>